Hello everybody. Today I'd like to speak about what the Lord showed me is going to happen after the bull run in the context of being a Joseph. If you're new to my channel, welcome. And if you're old, welcome. I wanted to thank everybody who supported me on Patreon and through the transition period of being demonetized on YouTube. I'm currently in the process of looking into X and uploading my videos onto X moving forward. The videos will also be uploaded onto Patreon and Rumble for those videos that YouTube might find offensive. I wanted to thank everybody for all the emails and for all the prayers and for all the support. I I'm sorry it's taken so long to make a video. I've been sorting out what to do next with YouTube because one of the things that YouTube discussed with me was the termination of my YouTube channel. And I've been on YouTube for an incredibly long time, for 10 years, preaching the gospel for 10 years. And I've managed to reach 10,000 subscribers and uh, the gospel has gone out to over 1 million people on YouTube. And so I'm very grateful for YouTube. So moving forward, I will only be posting YouTube friendly videos on YouTube. And the um, videos that may be censored will appear on Patreon, X and Rumble. All of those platforms are free. The Patreon option is also free. So there's not specific videos that are exclusive to Patreon yet. At the moment, everything is free. And if you feel led to give, uh, your support is greatly appreciated. And for those of you who have signed up with Patreon, I'm very, very, very grateful for you. So today we're going to be talking about what happens after the bull run. This is what the Lord has placed on my heart to share with you first, even though there's a few videos that need to be produced because I'm a little bit behind with my videos, making videos because of what's happened with YouTube. So the Lord wanted me to highlight Joseph. And when Joseph came to power as prime minister, one of the things that he did was he continued with his assignment as prime minister now, what the Lord wanted me to highlight to everybody is ask yourself the question, why didn't Joseph call home? He spent seven years being prime minister. Why didn't he call home? It could have been extremely easy for Joseph to call home because he knew where his family was. He knew that he was very well loved by Jacob and by Rachel. You see, Jacob and Rachel did absolutely nothing wrong to Joseph. It was his brothers that committed an offence toward him. And so it would have been extremely easy for Joseph to reconnect with his mother and father based on their relationship that he remembered Remember, Joseph was well favoured and well loved by both Jacob and Rachel. But Joseph chose to continue on with his assignment without contacting home. Now, there is a very good reason for why Joseph did not contact his family. He only saw his family seven years later when the Lord led them to him. You see, Joseph never operated in the flesh, which is one of the things that the Lord wanted me to highlight today. Is that after the bull run, we can choose to operate in the flesh and do things according to our own wisdom and our own understanding, or we can be led by the Holy Spirit. And so today I'm going to be discussing a case study that the Lord would have me highlight to everybody about a millionaire who owned a Goshen, and he was extremely charitable and he blessed his family. And on the surface, most of these things seem to be very Christian and they seem to be the right thing to do. But the Lord wanted me to highlight this specific story of where this particular Texan 
went wrong and why it is that it, that Joseph didn't call home. Why it is that Joseph didn't call home and why it is that Joseph continued with his assignment as opposed to the comforts of being um, a symbol in his family life. Um, you know, Joseph had his dreams come to fruition. Joseph understood that God was blessing him according to the dreams that God had given him, but still he remained reserved in his approach towards his family for a specific reason. And so this particular presentation is going to focus on this Pentecostal um, Texan who won the lottery and how his story unraveled in terms of buying a Goshen, being extremely charitable and blessing his family. So I've summarized the story of the particular Texan that I'm about to play for you guys here. And what I'd like you to meditate on is where he went wrong. Because there's certain things that I'd like to discuss after which the Lord has highlighted to me that might seem Christian things to do, but are they God-led or are you being led in your flesh? So here's that clip now. Winning the lottery is the best thing that can happen to us. Just imagine the things you can do with all the money and zero financial stress. It's got to be pretty amazing, right? For most lottery winners, I'm sure that's exactly how it feels. But if you don't handle your newfound fortune in the right way, your dream life can quickly become a living nightmare. This is the story of how Billy Bob Harold Jr. won the lottery and lost everything. Billy Bob Harold Jr. was a print shop manager from Humble, Texas. The ex-Marine had been running the print shop for an incredible 12 years when out of the blue, he lost his job. It was a huge blow to him. Billy was a 47-year-old church-going family man, and he didn't know how to support his wife and kids without his print shop. He started job hunting, but it didn't go well, and he lost several more jobs in the mid-1990s before he finally landed a job as a shelf stacker at the local Home Depot. You can probably guess that this job didn't pay too well, but there wasn't a lot of work available in Billy's small hometown, and he was out of options. He stuck with his shelf stacking job for the next three years. But, like all of us, he dreamed of winning the lottery and quitting his minimum wage job for good. So, he often scraped together a few coins and buy a ticket or two. If he picked his own numbers, he'd always choose his children's birthdays. But, it was a quick pick ticket that came through for him in the end. Billy had stopped by a Texaco Star Mart one Saturday in 1997 and grabbed a few lottery tickets. But, he didn't really think he'd win so he went to work without checking the numbers. It was only when he got home that evening that he checked the numbers in the Sunday newspaper. He couldn't believe what he saw. The numbers matched. He sent his son to the store to double check the numbers. They still matched, but he had to wait a full day to get confirmation from a lottery official. But when they finally got back to him, he got the best news of his life. He was the only winner of a $31 million lotto Texas jackpot. Billy and his wife made sure they handled their wins the right way. They immediately put the winning ticket in a safety deposit box and found an attorney with a good reputation to help. Finally, they got to collect their first check of 25 annual installments, and they now had a whopping $1.24 million in the bank. The five seconds it took to check those numbers have got to be the most exciting five seconds of Billy's life. He knew the first thing he wanted to do with his money, and it wasn't buying a flashy car like you're thinking. He was very religious, and he wanted to donate 10% of his winnings to the church. That's a very big and very generous amount of cash to give away, but he didn't stop there. He soon gave money to another church as well. Then, he started giving money to anyone who needed it, which turned out to be a lot of people. He started with his own family. He bought a ranch and houses for family members. Plus, his wife and each of his kids got a shiny new car. But other people had realized he was giving money away like it grew on trees. Every time someone from his church mentioned that they had financial troubles, he was ready to write them a check. Then, Christmas rolled around, and Billy was there, buying 480 turkey dinners for needy families around town. I guess he realized how good all the attention felt because it only got worse. He owned six houses now, 
although some were bought for family or friends. Soon, people were even showing up to his house to ask for money, and he'd give them what they wanted every time. This could have just been a sign that Billy was a naturally generous person, but it became obvious that he was just trying to impress people when he got a much younger girlfriend. Obviously, Billy's wife wasn't very happy about this, especially when Billy started buying this young woman expensive cars and jewelry. Just eight months after hitting the jackpot, his wife understandably contacted an attorney to help her divorce Billy. They agreed to split the lottery winnings. An agreement was signed, and Billy's marriage was over. But his wife wasn't the only thing that Billy lost. His spending was getting worse by the day, and he was now already in debt. It was at this time that Billy was contacted by a company called Stone Street Capital. The company told Billy they specialized in helping lottery winners who agreed to receive their winnings in installments to change their minds and get a lump sum instead. They struck up a deal with Billy to do this. The deal was that Billy would receive $2.25 million in one payment right away. In exchange, Stone Street Capital would receive $6 million over the next 10 years, which was the remaining half of the winnings that still belonged to Billy. But anyone can see that $2.25 million in exchange for $6 million is definitely not a good deal. Well, everyone, except Billy. Remember, Billy was seriously in debt by now, and that offer sounded like a good way to pay off his debt and continue living his lavish lifestyle. To everyone else, this looked like the scam it was, and they did everything they could to talk Billy out of it. His lawyer even told Billy that according to the law in Texas, lottery winners can't hand over their installment payments in exchange for a service. Even that wasn't enough to get Billy to listen. Before anyone could stop him, Billy had signed a contract that allowed Trust Corp America Incorporated to collect his half of the lottery winnings for the next 10 years. And only in exchange for a $2.25 million lump sum loan from Stone Street Capital. Wood's financial manager was desperate now. He'd done everything he could to talk Billy out of that scam, but it hadn't worked. He now tried to convince Billy to take out life insurance. He was worried that if Billy suddenly died, his family would never be able to pay all the estate tax he owed. But, in the end, it didn't matter. Billy hoped he could have got back together with his ex-wife after signing the contract with Stone Street Capital. But, when he asked, she said there was no chance she'd come back to him. That seems fair enough, since he had cheated on her with a younger woman. And he'd even publicly paraded her around town, so everybody knew. You can bet his wife felt pretty humiliated by the way he treated her. But even though she didn't want to get back together with him, she said he should come to her house to have dinner with the family. It was now just five weeks after he signed the deal with Stone Street. He arrived early for dinner that night. His ex-wife greeted him, but his children never got to see him that night. Instead of waiting to have a lovely dinner with his family, like the good old days, Billy had other, much more tragic plans. Before anyone can stop him, he locked himself in his wife's bedroom. Then, he put a shotgun to his chest and pulled the trigger. He was already dead by the time people started arriving for dinner. He'd come prepared with a stack of notes addressed to each of his family members. The note for his ex-wife said, I didn't want this. I just wanted you. His parents never believed he took his own life, but investigators say there was no other way he could have died. His children were mainly concerned about their finances. Billy's financial advisor had been 100% right about what would have happened if Billy suddenly died. Just like he'd said, Billy's kids inherited a shocking estate tax bill. They had no way of paying it off. To make matters worse, the $2.25 million that Billy had apparently received from Stone Street Capital had completely vanished. There's no doubt this is a tragic story, but hopefully you can learn some valuable lessons from it for when you win the lottery one day. There is a few things that the Lord wanted me to highlight after listening to that case study. I listened to it quite a few times and on the surface he seemed to have started really well. Um, if you look at item 1 to 7, those are all very Christian things to do. But the first thing that the Lord wanted me to share is that the retention of wealth is a lot more difficult than the gaining of wealth. And when it comes to Billy, um, point number 11, being financially illiterate, is possibly what guided most of his decision making um, right from the start. And we really need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit when navigating what we should do and what we shouldn't do. Because if you look at the story of Joseph, 
it would have been easy for Joseph to contact his family and immediately start blessing his family. But that wasn't really the part um, Joseph was to play in the kingdom. The Lord reserved a specific time for him to bless his family, a specific time for his family to come to him, a specific time to be um, revealed as Joseph. He didn't just reveal himself at the beginning of his, his assignment. And so when it comes to the case study with the Texan uh, Christian, what I realized from meditating on it and asking uh, the Lord, where did he go wrong? The generosity that he um, displayed in the beginning really was a form of people pleasing rather than God pleasing. You see, we can want to please those around us rather than wanting to please God. But has God instructed us to do those specific things? You see, there's a time that there will be a great famine, but it's discerning when the right time to bless people is. Because if we do things according to our flesh, um, that money can be um, can disappear very quickly. On average, it takes a lottery winner who has not received wise counsel two years to lose all their money and uh, Billy's fortune I think was 31 million US dollars which he had lost due to doing things incorrectly and there is a false humility with wanting to be God in other people's life and wanting to be the provider for other people that there is a false humility in that. Remember that people should lean on God for their provision. They shouldn't be looking at you for their provision. If God instructs you to bless somebody, that is completely different. But in the case of Billy, where he went around blessing everybody who asked for, for money because he had revealed that he had this money, it's a false sense of humility because he ends up being their source instead of God being their source. And so there is a subtle differentiation. And what happened really is because Billy got in the flesh and people exalted him um, for being their provider, the pride of life entered in. And that's when he chose to uh, change his wife and then really went downhill in terms of further poor financial decisions. The despair, unfortunately in this case, the despair ended up in him taking his own life. So when it comes to the bull run, what the Lord was showing me is that there's two types of situations that are going to occur. Remember Joseph identifies very heavily with the bull because of the covenant promise in Deuteronomy. 33 verse 17 where it says that in he in majesty he Joseph is like the firstborn bull his horns are like the horns of a wild ox with them he will gore the nations even those at the end of the earth such are the ten thousands of Ephraim and such are the ten thousands of Manasseh so the covenant blessing to Joseph is that he is the firstborn bull but it goes on further in Genesis 47 verse 6 where Pharaoh designated the best of the land of Goshen to give to Joseph. And he says in this scripture, he says, The land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land make thy father and brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. So here again, Pharaoh gives Joseph's brethren jurisdiction over the cattle so that you see there's a reoccurring theme with cattle, right? Pharaoh allows Joseph's family to govern his cattle. So we know that Joseph is very closely associated to the bull. And we know that the bull is a symbol of wealth in the Bible. There's nothing new under the sun. The Bible says that in Psalm 50 verse 10, the Lord God Almighty owns a 
cattle on a thousand hills. So all throughout the Bible, we know that cattle is a symbol of wealth. And it shouldn't surprise us that they've used the bull as a symbol of wealth on Wall Street to any Israelite, to any Jewish person who has studied the Torah. They understand why the bull is outside of Wall Street because the bull represents wealth. In the mind of the Israelite, what it reminds them of is the sacrifice that they were making to the golden calf in the wilderness where they exalted the bull above because they, in their mind they thought that the, the ways and the practices of Egypt were um, being they associated their understanding of blessing with the bull because they had just come out of Egypt. They had inherited the ways of Egypt. And so this understanding of worshipping of wealth is from um, the secular side of things, right? On Wall Street, they worship wealth. This is the secular side of things when you worship wealth. Similarly, what the law is saying to me is that the wealth can be used as an idol so that you can turn money into an idol or the money can be used to complete your assignment as a Joseph. And we know in Matthew 6 verse 27 it says you can't serve two masters. You'll either serve one or the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And so the bull is, 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 is not only symbolic of wealth, it's also symbolic of a Joseph. Now when we look at this case study of this particular um, Texan, the money became an idol whereby he exalted himself in the position of God and he made poor choices based on his understanding of how to distribute the wealth. Whereas Joseph, Joseph didn't call his family. Joseph waited on the Lord. And at the right time, he blessed his family. You see, with the Texan, he blessed his family. And that ended up, um, it ended up in him actually uh, making so many wrong decisions that were not led by the Holy Spirit. And so we need to pray for wisdom on how we navigate what happens after the bull run because it seemed very Christian what um, the Texan guy did. But really, if you look more closely and you listen to that story carefully, it really was rooted in um, the idolatry of self where he was the provider rather than God being the instructor of how the money should be used. And the bull is something that is throughout the Old Testament if you've studied the scriptures it's not an unusual thing. People worship the bull. This is the god Moloch and he is um, half human half bull and when practices like this become normal, the progression after making idols is sacrificing to those idols, right? You begin to sacrifice to those idols. And the loss of life is common when it comes to money. Uh, people end up in despair and they end up doing things that they wouldn't have ordinarily thought they would do. Because what money can do is money can bring out the idols in your life. Money can bring out the idols in your life. And it's not uncommon. There's some cultures that worship bulls um, throughout um, history. This is an, is an example of the Hindu culture where they worship the bull, just like how the Israelites were worshipping the bull. It's happening now today in modern day um in the in the in asia they they worship the cow um on wall street 
they also worship the bull on, on Wall Street. There's nothing new under the sun. So it's about having the wisdom to determine, really, um, where we place money in our hearts, right? Because two things can happen after the bull run. And when you look at the scripture in Exodus 32 verses 8, if we're not led by the Holy Spirit, we can end up making golden calves and we can we ourselves can elevate ourselves to becoming the golden calf that other people will worship because other people will come to us as a forms or as a form of uh, handouts and so it's really looking at asking the holy spirit to guide us uh, in, in in terms of what's right and what's wrong because all these things that the uh, texan pastor did were correct. He bought a, a ranch. He was charitable. He tithed. He blessed his family. But there is a season for doing these things. And that's what the Lord wanted me to highlight. There is a season. It's not that you're not supposed to bless your family. It's that there is a season for that. When things get incredibly difficult in 2030, there will be a season where you can bless people, just like how Joseph welcomed his family and blessed them. But he didn't welcome his family in his first seven years of uh, building up his uh, portfolio, building up his uh, assignment and doing what the Lord had called him to do, because there's an order. And the reason why there's an order is because the retention of wealth is far more difficult than the uh, acquiring of wealth and what the Lord showed me is that many people are going to end up cursing God they're going to curse God because they're going to say that they did all of these things they gave to church they gave to charities they gave to the needy then they, they bought their family members houses and cars they did everything they thought was correct they're going to end up exactly like this particular Texan who did not lean on God's understanding, he lent on his own understanding. Because like I said, if you're called to be a Joseph, there's a specific time where you're supposed to bless people, right? You're supposed to be led by the Holy Spirit. Because if you're not led by the Holy Spirit, you end up really worshipping uh, the money. The money will dictate the outcome. And the outcome... Most certainly what the, the Lord wanted me to highlight is be careful of people pleasing and false humility and the pride of life because these things are all going to be a test. You see, what the Lord was saying to me is this is going to be a test of success. You've passed the test of waiting. You've passed the test of trusting in God. You've passed the test of uh, following and being obedient to the instruction of investing but the next test is the hardest test and the test that you will be tested on is the test of success how successful will you be when you are successful because that's a lot harder it's a lot harder to depend on God when you're successful it's a lot harder to trust God when you're successful it's a lot harder to question your decision making when you're successful because you have the freedom to make the decisions independently on waiting on the Lord. And that's why the Lord wanted me to highlight this because Joseph waited. Joseph didn't call home according to his own understanding. He didn't um, highlight his own strength. He waited on the strength of the Lord. And so we will all be tested for success. We will all be tested on how we turn to the Lord with our decision making. Are we going to wait on the Lord for the, for the Lord to say yes? Or are we going to be dictated by what we might consider to be very Christian values? Giving to churches giving to charities, giving to people. I'm not saying be stingy. I'm not saying don't give. 
What I'm saying is that be led by the Lord in all your decision making. Because when you are at this level of wealth, it's easy to make decisions without waiting on the Lord. And the enemy can deceive us. We can be very deceived because whatever it is in our heart, the smallest thing that has not been crucified in the flesh, those things can surface when we are not yielding to God constantly and asking the Lord which way we should go. You know, it might seem like a good idea to buy a ranch, but have you prayed about it and fasted about it? Yes, you've got the capital to do it, but have you taken it to the Lord in prayer and considered what the heart of the Lord might be saying? Because it's going to be so easy to make decisions without inquiring of the Lord. And when we do that, the results are often despair because we're going to end up losing money like Billy and operating in the flesh. So I wanted to thank you very much for watching if you've made it to the end. Um, the Lord has shown me, you know, that the bull run is, we're at the doorstep of the bull run. Uh, the next video I'm going to be making is, a go is going to be about what the Lord showed me um, last month and in January and um, where we are in terms of uh, the entire process of waiting on the Lord and just um, what the Lord, what's in the Lord's heart regarding all these matters. So thank you very much for watching. These videos will now be uploaded on X, Rumble and Patreon. And if it's a difficult video that has sobering uh, truth, then it will not feature on YouTube. I wanted to thank everybody for your support. I particularly wanted to highlight um, Brother Jackson and give a shout out in loving memory of his uh, beautiful grandmother, Barbara, who has gone on to be with the Lord and... Um, what the Lord was showing me when I was praying for Brother Jackson was that it's okay that not everybody makes it to Goshen. Remember Rachel. Rachel was Joseph's mother and Rachel didn't make it to Goshen. But Rachel knew in her heart who her son Joseph was. And we have a cloud of witnesses. When someone departs from us, and when someone goes on to be with the Lord, we have a cloud of witnesses that is watching us run the race. And so we must continue to run the race that is set before us. Remember, the highest of high callings is to make it into um, uh, the promised land. And the promised land is not the Goshen here on earth. The promised land is being reunited with Yeshua HaMashiach, who is Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul says that death is gain. And so when somebody is in salvation, when they have salvation in Jesus Christ, when they go on to be with the Lord, we rejoice, knowing that they ran their race and they were faithful stewards of the things that uh, were given to them, the portion that was given to them. And so when we go on, because my grandmother as well passed away last year, and I thought she'd be a recipient of the blessings of the wealth transfer through me. But what the Lord showed me is that um, there's certain people who are not meant to make it to Goshen. And the Lord will give you peace as a Joseph if you've lost a loved one that you really wanted to bless, but the wealth transfer's been delayed. The Lord will give you peace about that because it is his will that it happened this way. And so I wanted to thank everybody for watching and thank you for your emails. I'm so sorry if I haven't had the opportunity to reply your emails. I've received so many as a form of support since being demonetized from YouTube. So many people have prayed for me and so many people have written in to, to tell me um, how this ministry blesses them. If I haven't had the opportunity to reply to you, I read all the emails and I rejoice when I receive an email. Please don't be offended if I don't reply. You are all well loved by me. You're all appreciated by me. And everybody who joined Patreon 
I'm so very grateful. Everyone who sowed a seed, I'm so very grateful. Um, if you are still a member of YouTube, I would encourage you to cancel your membership on YouTube and consider prayerfully if the Lord would have you join Patreon as a paid member. So thank you very much for watching. Shabbat Shalom.